God. Thank y'all. Have a seat. I just want to give them what I owe them. I owe them so much. I have moments every, you know, every day, every now and then. I'll, I'll, I'll smile a little bit because of something he did. Or I'll, I'll, I'll cry a little bit because of something he did. But I owe him that. I owe him the praise through it all. Praise God. Praise God. Well, good afternoon, everybody. How y'all doing today? Everybody ate well? Feeling good? No indigestion, hopefully? I had a little bit. <laughs> I had a little bit of indigestion, I will tell you. But that's because I was eating too much. But uh, um, we are continuing in our one word, one, our one word series. And Pastor gave me a word. And he done took us through. What he done, what he took us through, y'all? Save, sanctify, and fill with the Holy Spirit. All right? So as, as a good pastor does, he done got you saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I think he's doing all right. Now, we know he didn't do it. But he definitely reminded y'all that uh, those three words are very critical to our walk as Christians. Amen. So pastor's got us there. And, and I, he gave me a word. And I asked him what my word was a couple weeks ago. And he, he told me, he's like, well, uh, this your word. And uh, so that means I had to go do my work around my word. And so what, this word to me is like, uh, I, I, I'd say probably one of the top five words, I think, in the English language. I just think it's. It's that important of a word. Uh, it, you know, if it's said in the right way, if it's exhibited in the right way, it can change hearts. Yeah. It can change minds. It can help other people. Uh, there's a story of an author. His name is Rudyard Kipling. I don't, you probably don't know who that is. Jungle yeah, Jungle Book. Good job, Bonnie. Good job, Bonnie. He wrote the Jungle Book. And he also was a Nobel Peace Prize winner. In, uh, in, in 1907. At one point in his career, he became so popular that people were paying him by the word. Okay. So that means like they, everybody was hanging on his words. Like everything that was written in that era, he was so prominent and important that people were paying him for every word he would write. And a few college students that was, that was not too fond of his writing. <laughs> However, didn't appreciate it, and, and they said, you know what, let's, let's write him a letter, and we're going we gonna to enclose our 10 shillings at the time, right, for, for this word that he's going to give us. And it simply said, please send us your best word. They got a letter back from Kipling, and guess what the word said? Thanks. Thanks. Now, you can take it two different ways. He could have been just like, you know what, thanks. <laughs> Taking your money. Since you want to be acting funny, I'm just going to take your money, thanks. But then also, it could have been the fact that he just thought that much of the word thanks. That, he, that if he were, were to write one word down, he took the word thanks. Now think about that for a minute. Think about how that might change things if we were to use this word in the right way more often. So if you recall where Pastor ended up last week, he was in Ephesians. You can turn with me to Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. And he talked about being filled with the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to dovetail off of my pastor where he was, and I'm going to start there. He started in Ephesians. And, and when he talked about being filled with the Holy Spirit, he talked about what? He said, do not be drunk of wine, right? You all remember that last week, right? He did say that. He said, well, you know, if you have a little bit, he didn't tell you how much your much was. But he said, do not be drunk on wine. And he also said uh, in, in verse 19, oh, he talked about, you know, remember all the songs that he told us about, right? Y'all remember all them songs he played last week, all the different songs about some things that you put into your spirit, right? And some of the songs sound great, right? But the words weren't necessarily the greatest words that you want to put into your spirit. But in, in verse 19, it says, in Ephesians 5 and 19, it says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So I don't know about y'all, but every now and then I'll just start singing a song. Uh, and if my family, they, they know I'm not lying. I'll just start singing. I sing words all the time. And every now and then I'll just sing a word of praise to God just, just in the middle of the day, right? And so what this is saying is that you, you want to be filled with that joy exuding all the time, every day, right? 
And then in verse 20, it says, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, Minister D, you know, she took some of my scriptures today. It's all right, I love her though. But giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so talk, let's talk about thanks. Let's talk about thanks. Let's talk about, I believe, the four types of thanks. And so if y'all want to write these down, y'all can. But these are just my opinions of what four types of thanks is. Because y'all didn't even really realize that there's levels to thanks, did y'all? You, did you know? Ah, uh, see? See, that's the first one right there. That's what I call the superficial thank. All right? It's just like you just say it as a salutation. You put it at the end of your emails. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Hey, thanks. And then what Bonnie just did, I call 1A. It's called the stank thank. Okay, that's the stank thank. Like, gee, thanks. Right? You didn't really mean it, but you said it because that's what you think you're supposed to say or you wanted to let them know that you really didn't care about what they did for you or to you. Amen? Right? So that's number one. That's the superficial thing. Number two is the self-thank. Ah, thank me. I deserve this. I did this. I did this for myself. I, I thank myself for being who I am and doing the things that I do. Thank you, me. Y'all know, y'all heard that one before, ain't y'all? Oh, y'all heard of that one? That's a self thing, and uh, I heard it a couple times. I've said it a couple times, and I'm sure some of you have as well. If we're going to be honest today, the indigestion might start to bubble up a little bit more. Okay, but we're going to tell the truth today. The third one is the hypocritical thing. The hypocritical thing. And this is, this is hypocritical, right? And so when you think about this, this is the person that says, Oh, thank God I ain't like Bonnie. <laughs> thank God I ain't like Pastor Hayden. Boy, that Pastor Hayden, boy, thank God I ain't like him. That's hypocritical, right? When you think about that, you, if you want a story in the Bible, it's, you go to Luke uh, 18, uh, 9 through 14, and there you'll see the, the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector, okay? Pharisee was saying, thank God I'm not like the tax collector. And, but the Lord didn't hear his prayer, but he did hear the tax collector's prayer. What was the tax collector's prayer? Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on me. That's it. Didn't have all that extra, I, I'm better than, hypocritical talk of thanking, okay? So I gave y'all three already, the superficial, the self-thank, and the hypocritical thank that I think everybody has undid at least once or twice in their life, if we all being honest, we tell the truth. Okay. Fourth one is the biblical thank. I think that's the biblical thank. And that's God blesses me when I don't deserve it. So, Lord, thank you. Feel that? That was a little different, right? When you get that mercy that God has done something for you that you did not deserve, and yet, thank you, Lord, for getting me through this. Thank you, Lord for seeing me through. Thank you when I didn't really know if I was going to make it through. Thank you. That's that biblical thank right there. Okay, so y'all done seen them levels of what thank is. Okay, so when you think about that, I want to illustrate to you what I see as the, the, as the primary biblical thank in the Bible. I want you to go with me to Luke. Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17 and verse 11. And here we have the, sto the story of the Jesus cleansing the ten lepers. You, you guys heard that story before? What I, what I didn't know is that it's only found in Luke. I did not realize it's not any other gospel. So if you're looking for it, because you know a lot of things are repeated in the gospels. But this one is only in Luke. Okay. So if you want to hear this story, go to Luke 17, 11. And we'll start at verse 11, and it says, And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. So this is Jesus doing his route, right? It's always, he always found a way to get to Samaria. You ever thought about that? You know, Samarians was, the Samaritans, was, they weren't Christ believers. They didn't believe. They weren't Christians. They weren't followers of the way. 
But somehow, some way, he always seemed to find himself somewhere in that area. I tend to think he just kind of walked that way. You know, you know how you want somebody to see you? <laughs> you kind of walk the same way every time, you know, at work. You know, let me go to the fountain over here. You wanted somebody to see you. I almost feel like that Jesus knew that in Samaria, he was always going to encounter someone that he could take and take care of, that he could bless in that moment. And so it, it says, and it came to pass, he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And he entered into a certain village that there met him 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off. So you guys know what a leper is? Anybody have heard of leprosy? So leprosy is actually, um, it's a disease and it affects the nervous system. And it produces these red like rashes and skin ulcers across your body. Um, and it, it breaks down your muscles and you're fatigued and you're really tired and your limbs are numb. And it's just, it's just a, it's an ugly thing, right? When you think about it, you know, it's, you visually see someone with leprosy and then they also have to walk through it and feel that way all the time, right? There wasn't anything that could be a cure. And so these lepers were set aside, okay? They, they didn't get to hang with all of the rest of the people because they were set aside. And from a Jewish standpoint, leprosy, it was a disease which was the Jews supposed to be inflicted for the punishment of some particular sin. They, think, they thought it was because something they did. That they put these people off to the side and said, you know what, you can't hang with us because of the sin you did. And to be more than other diseases, a mark of God's displeasure. Okay, that's heavy. Okay, so first of all, I got this disease. I got something I don't even know how I got. I got rashes all over my face. I can't barely walk well. Um, my nervous system is being attacked. The Jewish people already told me that uh, I did something that I deserve this. And then not only that, it's the mark of God's displeasure. God don't like me either. Okay. So when I think about that, I don't see any people who have leprosy in here. Everybody's face is pretty smooth. You guys got some good skin. I see that. I see that all on y'all. Um, but I do think there's some forms of leprosy that are still occurring in our society. Now, it might not be literal, but it might be figurative. Break it down? Break it down. One, social leper. Are you a social leper? No matter what you do, what you feel, what you say, you're awkward in a social setting. You feel cursed and unwanted when people around you, you get a little nervous because you struggle to interact socially. You're not sure if people like you or not. And so you feel separated, like they see you coming. Oh, here he comes. He can't even talk right. He can't even act right. When he get over here, I get, I don't even know how to, he can't even hold a conversation. Feeling social, like a social leper, like I, I'm set aside because I'm just not good socially, right? Or maybe you might be a financial leper. You, you always have been bad with money. You've never made much and believe in some way that it's your fault. It's your fault. That it's your cross to bear that I'm never going to have a lot of money in my life. You tell people that, you know what, man, I, I don't know what I did, man, but I'm just never going to make a lot. I'm just never going to be that guy. And so you get seen as that person that's off to the side. Or you might be that success leopard. You might be the one who's, you no know, matter what I do, I just can't get a leg up. I mean, I've been working. I've been doing my thing. But I just can't get a leg up for some reason. Now, what did I do? I know I did some stuff. I cheated on that girl back in ninth grade. I know. I did. But, but why can't I get up? What is wrong with me? Everybody else is coming up. I see my boys over here, my brothers, my sisters over here. They all doing well, but for some reason, I'm set aside. I feel like a leper in this place. Relational leper. How about that? Feel like you're doomed in relationships. None seem to work out. That dude that you liked, that girl that you thought was the right one, didn't work out. Meanwhile, all around you, your friends getting married, having babies, starting families, and you sitting over here like, 
what, did, what am I doing wrong? Like, what is on me? Like, I, 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 I feel like I'm a good person. I feel like I, you know, I'm compatible with people. What's wrong with me? So you, you, you find like you feel like you're that relational leper. Now, you could probably add another five or ten of these to the list. But what I'm saying is that all of us at some point in time have felt set aside. And that people saw you coming and was walking the other way. That's real talk. Okay? So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and read verse 1 and 2 again. And it came to pass as he, uh, uh, Luke 17, 11, And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the, the midst of Plano and Prosperous. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten members of Heart Fellowship that were lepers, which stood far off. And they lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy. Have mercy on us. They called out his name. They said, and they lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, in verse 14, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. See, sometimes Jesus just wants you to just go. See, he didn't have a whole lot of conversation for you in that. He just said, hey, oh, go, go show yourself to the priest. Go ahead, go ahead. But see, what we do, what we, but, gee, but Jesus, I'm, I'm a leper. I know you're a leper already. Just go you show yourself. Go show yourself because I've already cleansed you. We have to get in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirit. When he said go, just, just go. Just go. Because he said it's already done, right? So just go. So what, what do you see in that, right? There's an opportunity to just be obedient to what God is telling you to do. Okay? So then in verse 15 it says, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, all that stuff done fell off. He walking better. You know, his, all that red on his skin is gone. His muscles feel a little bit stronger. And when he saw that he was healed, turned back. And with a loud voice glorified God. Glory to God. Glory to God. See, and see, what happens most of the time is you get to that thing that he told you he was going to give you. Oh, no, I'm no longer a social leper now. Everybody likes my stuff on Facebook. Everybody likes my stuff on Instagram. Even though they took away the likes, they're going to bring them back because I'm thou all that. <laughs> yes. People pay me for my social behavior, okay? I'm, I, I, I am no longer a leper in any regard, okay? But and also, I got this relationship with this chick now, this girl, this woman, my girl, my ace, my ride or die. Yeah. She rolling with me now, and we just got it going on, and can't nobody tell us nothing because, man, I'm happy as can be with this woman, man. It is it is all that, and you know what? Now, guess what? That job I never got before, boom, finally came through. Came through, now I'm a leader. Yes, indeed, I'm making them six figures. They gave me a bonus plus stock options, yeah. Rolling. I'm in it now, okay? But, but, but what happens is, are you one or are you part of the nine? The one said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The other nine just kept on rolling. They was gone. They ain't stop. They ain't turn back. They ain't say nothing. They was gone. So when you get that promotion, when you fall in love, thank you, Jesus, is what I need you to say loud. Loud and proud out to God. Just tell him Thank you. 
because that would not have happened without him. And they fell down on his face. Fall down on your face. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. When the last time y'all been down here? When the last time y'all been down here? I can see all of the goodness of this. Thank you, Lord. Sometimes we need to get down and fall on our face and tell him, thank you, Lord. See, sometimes, because we, 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 get, we, get we get too cute with it. We get too cute with it. We just, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thanks, God. You know, this, this, this is how you do it. Oh, thank you, Lord. You know, when you're talking to somebody, right? It's just, they got, we get too cute with it. We're not, it's not being real. And so, verse 16, it says, it says he falls on his feet. In verse 17, it says, and Jesus answered, said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? I like to picture it like this. Jesus said, y'all go ahead, man. Y'all did it? Okay. Go show yourselves to the priest. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thanks. Oh, thank you. Hey, where, where the other nine at? You ever, been, have, you ever had a time where you thought somebody was coming? <laughs> thought somebody was coming, you keep looking for them. You kind of, you, you know, Pastor Hayden come talk to me, hey Mo, what's going on? I'm like, hey bro, what's going, what's going on? You know, you're talking to him, but you still, I'm still waiting for Cindy to come. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking for out this eye right here, right? You know, that's what I feel like. It's like, he's like, where are you? This is one time where I saw displeasure from my Lord. Jesus was displeased. Not pleased at all. Where are the other nine? Now, there's not a lot. <laughs> there's not a lot of scriptures I've seen. And I'm sure Pastor Hayden or Pastor White can probably point out some. But there ain't a whole lot of scriptures where I've seen when Jesus even concerned himself with other people. He was concerned with whoever it was that I was dealing with. I'm dealing with you right now. I don't really care about what's going on with them. But in this verse, where are the other nine at? He wanted to know. And so in, in verse, it keeps going in, in, in verse 18. It says, there, they are not found. Wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me see if I'm saying that right. Let me say that right. So is that 18? So Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleans, but where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Only person that came back to say something was the Samaritan. The non-Christian. Non Christian came back. So if it's 10 of us, count it out 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Only one of y'all coming back. And is all y'all Christians in here? I guess none of y'all ain't coming back then. I guess none of us ain't coming back because the only one that came back was the foreigner. So we are Christians. What does that mean? Followers of Christ, followers of the way. But yet, the one who came back was not a Christian. So, see, the, the, the law don't change. If, if someone thanks God, even though those atheists will thank God when they get down and something happened to them, they'll say, thank God. It, it still applies. He still hears that. It still applies. But what it is, is the problem he's not hearing is my Christians telling me thank you for the things that I've done. Hmm. Something to think about. I tell you, man, that turkey is, is turning. I'm going to have to have Deacon Ray escort me out the side door. <laughs> because we, we, got, we got some work to do. We got some work to do about thanks. Y'all thought this was going to be one of them Thanksgiving, kumbaya, after Thanksgiving, <laughs> make you feel good type ones, didn't y'all? Don't lie. Tell the truth. You thought, oh, pastor just going to have Mo get up there and say, oh, thank everybody. Thank you, thank you. 
See, y'all ain't got, y'all ain't got it right. I ain't got it right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And then it says, and in verse 19, and he said unto them, arise unto him, the one, arise. Go thy way, thy faith have made thee whole. See, the others, they were, uh, they were cleansed through the power of, of, of the Lord. They were cleansed through the power. This one cleansed through his faith. Different. God can do anything. He can do everything. And if he wants to cleanse you, it'll happen. But if you have been praying about that thing and believe in him about that thing, and then it happened and it came to pass, thank you, Jesus, is what you might get out of that. Not just because of the power of God, but for the fact that you prayed and stayed faithful in it, and it was delivered. Now, I scared mama up front when I said that that fast. She's like, ooh, thank you. Lord, she got, he got me. But, but what I call in, in verse 19 is what, in, in the, I'd rather be a spiritual leper. Hear me out. Hear me out. See, to me, a spiritual leper is one who feels like you're not worthy to be in his presence. And, and, and that you are humbled that God has shown mercy on you so much. And the very first thing you want to do is just give him thanks. It's, I'd rather be set aside as a spiritual leper, the one that just don't feel like I can be even in the presence of the Almighty because what it does is just humbles my spirit. That's the kind of thanks the one shows. But where's the other nine? When you talk about a life of thanksgiving, this is what God is speaking of. He wants you to have that spiritual awe. He wants you to just be humble and thankful for all of the things that you just do not deserve. He will give it to you. But he wants his glory first. Okay, that's why Jesus said, where are the other nine? Because he wants to give you it, but you got to give me the glory first. And not six months later when you thought about it, but right now before you get the benefit of it. Are y'all hearing me in that? You will see God wants to get the glory before you get the benefit. See, when you, when you think about mercies and, and the blessings that you get, they're doubled and they're sweetened when, when you've given him the glory for it, when you've, when you've had the faith for that thing and it came to pass. It's sweeter then. And, and, some, of, and some of the blessings that you, you feel like you get and the ones that you've stored up, and the ones that come now, it's, it's, it's different when you've, when you've prayed and had faith over those things. And the blessings just come a little bit more bountiful. And you feel like there's some favor in your life. You feel like there's favor in your life because you've done that thing. Because that's all he is asking. He is simply saying, give me my glory before you get the benefit. It's like when you start that job, the first 30 days, they don't give you no benefits right out of there. All right, they don't give you no benefits right out the gate. You got to wait. God is saying, you can get the benefits, but just give me glory. Just say thank you. What a biblical thanks. Okay? So, so as, as Pastor talked about, God desires for us to live a spirit-filled life, right? We talked about being spirit-filled. So I want to take us through, and then I'm going to be done. I promise. First Thessalonians, where my wife started this morning. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 19. And I'm going to put a little bit of different spin on, on what she said to you guys. In verse 16, it says, rejoice evermore. Rejoice evermore. So we talk about 
what it is to lead a spirit life filled life. We talked about in Ephesians how we, we walk around with the Psalms in our heart and our mind. That's the rejoicing. Rejoice evermore. Always be rejoicing in everything you do, right? And then in verse 17, it says, pray without ceasing. Okay. All right. So that's prayer all the time. Now, that doesn't mean you got to walk around just be praying like this. Oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. Like, thank you, Jesus. That Lord, thank you, Jesus. Jesus, like, thank you. No, that's not what it's saying. He's saying, but all throughout the day, when you know when he's done something, pray. When you have something going on, that meeting that you got to walk in, pray. That test that you're about to take, pray. All the time. Pray without ceasing. Don't stop. I love these verses because they're very simplistic. Very easy to follow. Rejoice. All the time. Pray. Don't stop. And in verse 18, it says, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So let's break down, let's break down uh, verse 18. I'm going to start from the backside, come to the front. For this is the will of God. How many times you heard that? You're asking all the time, is this the will of God for me? I'm not quite sure. I don't know what I should do. I just want to know what God's will is. I just want to be operating in his will. Will. This is his will. How easy is that? He simply said, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do you understand what in Christ Jesus means? You want to break it down? It very simply means this. We have placed our faith in him concerning every aspect of our lives. That's what it means. That we have placed our faith in him concerning every single aspect of our lives. So it is his will that we thank him in everything we do because we trust him with every aspect of our lives. Not some. Every aspect of our lives. Okay? So, for this is the will of God. So now you know what the will of God is. If you ever want to know, at some point, you do know that the will of God is this. Because it says it. We believe every word in the Bible is true, correct? So the will of God is to in everything give thanks. I'm going to tell you why in a minute. It's really what's going to hit you. In everything give thanks. What does that mean? Does that everything? Is it the bad things? Is it some of the good things? Is it, what is it? When y'all think of everything, what y'all think? Everything, right? So, but does God really want us to be thankful for the evil things in the world, the evil things that happen in the world, when the babies die or there's mass killings, when there's uh, abortions, there's, there's uh, molestation. Do, do, does he want us to thank him for those things? Does he really want us to thank him for those things? But see, what, what I want you guys to realize is that bad things happen to good people. In a world where it is broken and sin is in it, it is an unrealistic expectation to believe that nothing bad will ever happen. Bad things do happen to really, really good people. But God allows the things he hates to do the things he loves. See, he allows the things he hates to do the things he loves. So he don't want us to be thankful for the evil. But he does want us to be thankful that he is working through it 
working in it at all times. He does not stop working for you. You special. You special. You special. You special. He has not stopped working for you all the time. He's working for you. So even though something bad happened, he wants you to say, thank you, Lord, for working through this for my good. You're going to work, Lord. I know this sucks right now. But see, because we don't have to be controlled by our emotions, y'all. As you become more mature as a human being, we should see less and less of you being controlled by your emotions. Because if you're still pouting around at 45, 50, 60, crying about stuff and all that mess, and I can see on your face every time that you're mad or something and you, don't really, you can't get out of it, and that I don't feel like doing it so it don't matter, you only do what you feel like, you're letting emotions control you. That's not what God is intending. So even in those things that are not great, he is just simply saying, Lord, I'm glad you're working in this. I'm glad you are working in this. You guys know who Matthew Henry is? Anybody know who Matthew Henry is? Raise your hand. Pastor. Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry and, and me are pretty cool. Matthew Henry writes a commentary about the Bible. So when I study, I always have Matthew Henry commentary open. So Matthew goes way back with the Bible. So Matthew Henry and the Bible commentary, they work together. What the commentary does, it gives you an opportunity to really have a conversation about breaking down those scriptures when you're not quite sure what it means, he has a commentary. So he's basically telling you his opinion of it. But he's very well renowned. Matthew Henry got robbed one time. And uh, they, they talked to him afterward. They interviewed him. And, he's, and they said, you know, Matthew, how are you feeling after you got robbed? And he said, number one, I'm thankful he never robbed me before. Secondly, I'm thankful that although he took my wallet, he didn't take my life. Number three, he took what I had, but it wasn't that much anyway. And number four, I'm glad that it was I who was robbed, not I who did the robbing. See, see what is that? You see the level of maturity in a man who says that? No, 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 he probably was upset. He probably was a little fearful, probably was a little on edge. But what he did when he settled down, it was to think, I'm still black. I'm thankful he never robbed me before. He could have been robbing me on a daily, like waiting around the corner. You ever had that bully at school? Man, I used to get bullied at school. When this dude used to take my lunch money uh, almost every single day. Every day. Like, you come around the corner, here he come again. They didn't even stop. He's saying, I didn't get, I'm, hey, it was only the first time. <laughs> I'm thankful that although he took my wallet, he didn't take my life. It could be so much worse. He took what I had, but it was not much. And then finally, I'm not out here robbing people. I could very well be. And sometimes I look across, I was in San Francisco. 180,000 people there for a conference that everybody paid about $3,000 for a piece for Salesforce. We were literally walking over homeless people on the street. You want to stop, you stop. I, just, I had to stop a couple times and just be like, that could be me. Thank you, Lord. But, 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 but what is, they didn't do anything. They're not lepers. But when you think about the goodness of God, thank God. See, what I want to end with here is that when we pray and are thankful to God, it fuels the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. It, that's the fuel for the Holy Spirit. 
Okay. When you talk about that Holy Ghost fire, you know, Fred Hammond say that, that Holy Ghost fire. I love when he say that. That's that spirit field. That's that Holy Ghost fire. That's when you're feeling the spirit. That's like when you're thankful and you're praying. <laughs> that's how you feel the spirit. And so when you think about this, what does the spirit of the Lord produce? You ever heard of the fruits of the spirit? Okay. What are the fruits of the spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You see, I, I think I heard Pastor Hayden say, I just want to make sure my spirit man is being fed. He said that, he said that, he said because, you know, maybe the outside might be a little pudgy right here, you know what I'm saying? It might be a little, I don't got the six pack no more. But the spirit man is being nourished. I like to call him fit, pastor. I want him to be fit. I want him to be in the gym. You know what I mean? So, so I don't want him to be too little, but I don't want him to be too big. I want him to be ripped right in the middle. Right? That's all I want the spirit man to be. And that's what, that's what he designs for you, too. When do we get the spirit? When do we get the spirit? When we get saved. Okay, pastor. But the spirit man got to grow up. Spirit man needs to be fed. And so pastor talked about, y'all saw his analogy, which was amazing last week. But all of that stuff y'all putting in there, it's got to be the good stuff. Thanksgiving, yeah. prayer. Yeah. That's what makes it all come clean. Yeah. Now, that extra mess y'all putting in there ain't what it needs to eat. Right. Right. And, and then how many times have, if I throw a tray of orange from an apple tree, would you believe I said, it's from the apple tree, would you believe me? Absolutely not, why is that? Because a, a, a tree can only produce the one type of fruit that it has. I can't pick an apple from an orange tree. So if the fruit of the spirit are those things, that's the only thing that it exudes. If you want to know if, the, if you led by the spirit, is it kindness, love, peace, joy? If it ain't none of that, then it ain't by the spirit. I'm giving y'all some simple answers today. and This ain't hard stuff. This is the easy stuff. If it is not about those things, if those are not being exuded, because the spirit can't do nothing other than that. He don't want to do nothing. Other. He doesn't want to manifest himself in any other way. If you tell me you led by the spirit and you go do something that causes angst or harm to someone else, that is not of the spirit. His reputation is on the line. He don't roll that way. I'll only produce good fruit. <laughs> Kindness, love, peace, self-control. The Spirit didn't tell you to go over that girl house that night. He told you to exercise self-control and stay home. So if you really are trying to feed and nourish the Spirit, be very careful about the very next verse. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 19 says, Simply, quench not the spirit. Quench not the spirit. Don't quench the spirit. How do you quench something? Pour some water on it. Throw some dirt on the fire. What did I call it? The Holy Ghost fire, right? It's the Holy Ghost fire. So how do I, how do I take the Holy Ghost fire out? I throw some dirt on it. I put some water on it. Matter of fact, Anything that accelerates the fire, I eradicate. Hear me on that. Hear me on that. So if the fire, if the fire in a, in a, in a, in a bush is uh, lowering, you got me, baby? Okay. California, half of it on fire. All of the fire in the bushes. If it came to concrete, it couldn't burn the concrete. So you have to remove, remove anything that could be a fire. So if you are filling the Spirit, the Holy Ghost fire, with thanks and praise, 
guess the best way to eradicate that? Guess the best way to make sure that that fire fizzles out? Stop praying. Stop giving thanks. Walk away. Lord, thank you, I'm done. You know what? I got what I need. I'm good. Eventually, you find yourself, the distance between you and God keeps growing. It keeps growing. So if you want to keep the Holy Ghost fire, you got to keep thanking God all the time, praying without ceasing, rejoicing always, because then you won't quench the spirit. But if you do, if you don't, if you don't, when you get all into them complaining modes and all of that stuff and you always want to, you know, uh, oh man, I can't get what I want, self-righteous, I can't control myself, I'm defensive. I quench the spirit. You just pour water all over your spirit. Stop complaining. Stop crying about it. Stop being self-righteous about it. Stop being stressed out about it. Allow God to do his thing. Be thankful for every single thing you have. So God has taken a loved one, which is very hard. Thank him for the peace that you get eventually. Don't, don't be thankful for being cheated on. Don't be thankful for that. Just thankful he will bring you real love because of it. Don't thank him about the stress. Just the goodness that comes from the situation. And so don't thank for your fits of rage, but the self-control that comes through it. And so we got to give him what we owe him. We got to give him what we owe him. I'm not going to tell everybody, oh, if everybody just be more thankful, the whole world will be a better place thing. Because y'all thought y'all was coming here for that anyway. But what I'm saying is if you want your life to be better, if, we, if it's just you, not nobody else, it's just you, just you, just thank him. Live a life of thanksgiving. It will inspire someone else to do the same because they're always going to want to know what it is about you that's different. If you live a life of thanksgiving, give them what you own, church. Give them what you own. <laughs>